All right. Okay. Um, um, let me find my source sheet. Let's share. So uh, we we discussed. Um, I wanted, to, I wanted to take a uh, a, 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 a class in a series um, to look at some of the spiritual um, interventions. I think that's what I called it, spiritual interventions, and uh, th that are kind of common in in Jewish life as, as a way of responding to uh, to sickness. And one is a very uh, kind of basic one, which is the uh, you know saying a mishaberach for somebody, a, 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 a mishaberach blessing, and uh, the other I want to speak about it, which I know less about and is a little more, you know, is is hafreshat chala, taking separating chala, you know, as a way of, uh, you know, praying for for someone who's sick or for the sake of someone who's ill. And um, the other way, you know, there's also there's a rifa'enu bracha in the Amidah, right? So three times a day in the weekly Amidah, one of the things we request is is healing. And so that's like a generic prayer for healing. And you can insert the name of somebody who for whom you're concerned about, whom you're, you know, worried about, who is in need of, of healing, in that bracha as well. That um, that's a that's private, and so these are public things that we do. Are a um, mishaberach blessing, like a blessing, a public blessing uh, associated with Torah reading in shul on a Torah reading day, and hafrishat uh, chalai, which is not necessarily public, but uh, often you see now it's like a very like social media resonant mitzvah. Okay, because you see sometimes especially women will say, oh, I, I'm making challah now, send me the names of people to pray for, you know, and I'll separate challah. And it's, um, which, which is sort of a strange, uh, or not a strange, it just requires, like, I don't know if you, uh, I saw you were like nodding a little bit, maybe like you've seen this, you've heard this, maybe you've done this or. Um, Sorry, did you mean me? Anyone, I don't know, I think, but I think the two of you have, uh, I, that's the, I think I saw both of you nod actually, so you could both uh, say if, you, if this is something you're familiar with or have seen or done or, uh, mm -hmm been recruited to? I uh, I have heard of, and like, I, I have friends who do it, and um, and I have heard of other people doing it. Okay. Um, Leora? I mean, I think similar. Like, I know plenty of people that do it. I mean, I think, like, in davening, like, that part in, like, the Amina, like, that, that I've said before and used before. Yeah, so I guess I guess my like um, just like so the editorial comments I'll say is I strongly recommend like adding things to the Amida that are appropriate for each of the brachot. I think that's like a really a wonderful way to make the Amida a little more personal, and and to, I think it it helps the tefillah be more just sincere. You're not just saying if I wrote, you're kind of like saying things that you're like focusing on the words, even the words that are printed in the sidur. Maybe you say them with a little extra focus and like gravity if you're adding like your own like issues of existential importance, okay? I've spoken about this in the past other contexts, but so certainly if there's somebody you're worried about, who's at your, yourself or someone that you know, who's healthy worried about, it's appropriate to say and refrain you and, uh, and the other things that, you know, as appropriate in the other, you know, the themes of the other brachot in the middle of the Amidah. Um, I, I, my, uh, Sarah, my, my wife, Sarah had a, um, had the occasion of, of just being, you know, she, she bakes, since we moved to Chicago, we, we don't, I don't, if I can go to the internet, but I guess I, I you know, we, we don't love any of the challah that you can buy in any of the stores here in Chicago. It's not like, so, so since we moved here, almost every week, Sarah bakes a challah or she bakes or she freezes and she, whatever, but she, we don't, you know, we're not, sort of, we haven't found like a, a, a purchasable challah that we particularly, although what's the one that we like, whatever, is that one uh, they used to sell here. It doesn't matter. They sell it at Emma's, you know, uh, doesn't matter. Okay. This doesn't matter, but but in general, we, we she bakes challah every week, and but the the quantity of, of of dough that she makes, a typical for her recipe, isn't sufficient to separate challah with a bracha. It's like two, it's below the requisite minimal quantity of flour, and so she separates challah but without a bracha because it's not like the full the full mitzvah. So, you know, she, she at some some point there was like a, you know, some call. She saw something on on Facebook or maybe an email chain of oh so and so is sick. Could you please, you know, separate challah and have this person in mind, and she's like, oh, maybe I should like double my recipe so that I have enough flour so I can separate challah with, with a bracha and then I can include, and then she's like, wait a second, like, or, or I can just like daffin for this person, you know, <laughs> like I can't, you know, like I'm sorry for that your father, mother, sister, brother is sick, but like I, I, I'll, just, I'll just daffin for them and I'm, I'm not gonna like alter my, you know, and so, so it started her thinking and we, she and I have talked about like, where does this come from and why? And so I, I don't, I don't have an answer, but we'll we'll see some sources on that and why why maybe it's such a sort of a resonant uh, practice. Um, but it, you know, however far back, and it can't be traced back very far, but um, we can talk about it. But but the Mishra Barak is sort of interesting as well. It's a public declaration, right? It's uh, let, me, let me share my screen. You can look at the let's uh, 
Um, but, but there's some controversy with, with the Mishaberach. So I want to explore the controversy. So the Vedic was opposed to the Mishaberach for the sick in the, in, the, in the version that we recited here at our shul. Um, and based on this Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, this is our first, let me, let me number the sources. Hold on, so you can, source one, okay? And I'm also going to, um, I'm also going to, um, Sorry, um, I'll share the link as well. Okay, so hold on. in the chat. So if you that's okay. So now you can you have the source sheet. So if you want, you can play with it and do whatever you want, and you know, um, you know, but or or you can watch along my screen. So Maria Zbrichet says, Shashad Zbarim Maskirin Avonotav Shel Adam. There are three things that, that um, recall a person's sins. Okay, you do these things, it puts you in a situation where you are, um, you know, God is going to examine, count up your merits and demerits. These are they, Kirnatui, the Yuntfila, uh, sorry, Kirnatui, the Yuntfila, Mosar Dina So the three are um, walking under a wall that's, that's, um, that's leaning, an inclined wall, okay? Like, in other words, this is a dangerous place. You walk under an inclined wall, it, you know, you're kind of trusting that that the wall is going to stay standing, that it's not gonna fall as it's inclined to do. So, like, at that moment, God is sort of saying, oh, does this person deserve a miracle or not? Uh, that, that, that's what's happening at that moment. Iyun tefillah, which we're gonna leave untranslated for now, and Musar dinah which is uh, like, um, uh, you know, like, like being judgment about, uh, passing a judgment on somebody else, okay? Like uh, when Sarai said to Avram, uh, you know, my anger is going to be upon you. And what happened? Who died first? She did, okay? So, you know, you kind of uh, make make a judgmental statement about somebody else, like it kind of bounces back on, on you. So, the, and, and it's, you know, this person, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, so it's like a haughty, arrogant thing to do that's dangerous because he's sort of saying, I deserve for this person to be punished based on what they did to me. I'm so angry at them. Um, they hurt me. And, and because I'm such a good person, they deserve to be punished because of the pain they caused me. So God says, oh, really? You know, let, 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 let's, let's examine, let's open up your file and see if that's true. Okay. You walk under a rickety la a, a, a wall that's, that's, and that's going to fall. So God says, oh, you, you, you need this wall to stay up. Okay. You need a miracle to keep you alive. Let me look at your file and see if, if you deserve that. So the third one, the middle one, which I have is Iyun Tefillah. Um, Iyun Tfila can have a very positive connotation. Iyun can mean like, um, I don't know, like investigation or um, being deeply invested in something, Iyun, right? Um, so they translate it here as expecting prayer to be accepted, which is how it's been traditionally understood. Um, you see uh, the Tosfa, at source two, and it's how to Iyun Tfila de Hachiki, who, uh, based on this, uh, it's actually just the, the underlined parts, which I translated. Um, because he, because he, there, there seems that there are places uh, elsewhere in the Talmud where it suggests that Iyun Tfilah is a good thing. Here, it's obviously a bad thing. So, what is, is it? So, Lo Yitzchak and the Furesh Ken. Like, don't, 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 don't interpret it like that's just sort of what's I just like. Let me pause for a second. Let me open a tangent to talk about the Tosfot. The Tosfot, okay. The Talmud is from the, let's say, the sixth century. The Tosfot are in the 11th, 12th, into the 13th century, let's say, and the cool thing the Tosfot did was they compared, right? It says this passage and this passage of the Talmud means X, but there's, here's a contradictory source in Talmudic literature from some completely different location. And let me read them dialectically in conversation with each other and we'll figure out some, some new understanding of both of those sources. Okay, that was this real, right? The first step in Talmudic scholarship, like that before the Tosfot was, was really like, what does this text in front of me mean? What do these words mean? What does this sugya mean? What is this conversation, this debate? What's it about? What's happening? That's what Rashi does, okay? Once you have that, once that's done, once you have Rashi, then what the Tosfos do is, well, actually, the Talmud can't be read in, you know, page by page. It has to be understood globally. And any passage in Talmudic literature can be thrown together uh, to raise a contradiction. And then let's try to resolve those contradictions in fruitful, creative ways. That was the genius of the Tosfos. They revolutionized Talmudic scholarship in the, you know, whatever, the 11th and 12th, 12th centuries, let's say. So 
the first part of this Tosfot is, is, is quoting other places in Talmudic literature where Iyun Tfilah seems like a good thing. Obviously here it's a bad thing. So what does it mean? It's somebody who's certain that his prayer will be heard. Um, and that's a bad thing. Because if you're certain that your prayer will be listened and that your, um, you know, your request, your plea will be, um, like God will respond and agree, then that's a certain hearty, right? Then that, that, that inspires God, as it were, to say, oh, really? Um, that's how you're, you're so pious that you're praying and expecting me to accede to your request. Let me open up your file and, and see if you really deserve that or not. Um, last little here. Um, okay, this guy is so sure that his merits are so great that let, 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 let's check and see if that's really true. Let's check if that's really true. Um, so the Mishaberic prayer, right? We say, um, it's here we can sort of skip. Um, well, actually, I don't have the, the version that, the version that, that, as we say, actually, don't, I don't have the version that we have on, on the source sheet. The version that we say of Mishaberic is. God who bless our ancestors, bless the sick person. What would we say? Why? Because all the whole congregation is praying on their behalf. So please send them healing right now. Thanks, God. Um, so, so the basic thought this was a violation of, of this um, of this Gemara, as understood by Tosfot, that it was uh, it was a haughty expectation that God should listen to our prayers, and he thought that was inappropriate. The and and he actually felt the same way about the Misha Berach that we do for someone who gets an Aliyah. We say Misha Berach. We say Bavur She Allah Lichlod Shabbat Lichlod Torah. Right? You know, let let you know the one who blessed your ancestors bless this guy on account of the fact that in honor of the Torah he you know receives an Aliyah, and in that merit you know he should be uh, rewarded, etc. You know, we say Mishabech Rashu also, you know, for the, the woman who carries the Torah, we say, you know, when this used to happen, you know, in, a year ago, we would say, right, before she, what would we say, I'd say, uh, she, I don't remember, I'd say, uh, and because she is, uh, you know, carrying the Sefer Torah, returning it to the Ark, God should reward. So that, that's expecting, it's a reward for, you know, it's, it's demanding a reward for a mitzvah, which is, uh, which is not, not appropriate. It, it's sort of within, that, within this rubric of, of Iyun Tfilah. So the basic was against the whole Mishaberic format, except for the, the more original version of the Mishaberic, which he was comfortable with, which was um, based on, which, which if the Mishaberic is a, a pledge of charity. Because there's another, another famous Gemara, it says uh, in Ta'anit, Ashkar Rabbi Yochan the Yenuka, Rabbi Yochan found a, uh, one of the, the young child of Rish Lakish. Rish Lakish was uh, Rabbi Yochanan and Zacharuta, the study partner, they were and brother-in-law, uh, and uh, they had a very, very intense relationship. Rabbi, Yoch Rabbi Lakish was a like a gladiator, highwayman uh, before he started studying Torah. Rabbi Yochanan encouraged him to become a Torah scholar instead of a gladiator highwayman. But in one of their arguments, um, uh, they, there was like a harsh exchange of words, and Rabbi Lakish died. And Rabbi Yochanan was inconsolable. It's a very famous uh, stories of love and friendship in the Talmud. Um, and uh, so it was very, very intense. Anyway, so this is a story about Rabbi Yochanan, one of Rabbi Yochanan's sons. So there's Ruta's son, as he says, I'm really, um, Emily Psuka. So, so, so tell me, uh, Pasuk, what, what, what's, what are you learning? G give me a verse in the Torah that you're learning right now. What are you studying? He says, Aser Taser, which literally means, uh, well, they translate, a tithe shall you tithe. Right, aser taser, or maybe we, we often with these sort of double language in the term, we often translate it as "you shall surely tithe." Aser taser. I'm really my aser taser. What does that mean? I'm really aser b'shvil shetit aser. Take masro, tithe, give tithes, so that you become wealthy. Um, so. Somehow giving tithes, separating from your produce to give to the Kohen, to give to the Levi, to give to the poor, um, that will lead to wealth. You'll be rewarded with wealth. I'm relaying monologues. How do you know this is true? I'm relaying. Zeal Nasi, go test it out. 
Are you allowed to test God? Are you allowed to are you allowed to do things like do mitzvah and expect that God will reward you? Right? You're not allowed. It says in Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, uh, you shall not test the Lord your God. So um, how can you like do a trial to see if it's really true that giving to charity will result in and, and giving Truman and Maestro will result in, in wealth in this way? Um So what do we say? Except for this. This is the only example. You can't test God except for this case. Um, because Malachi, we have a verse in Malachi that proves uh, bring the whole tithe into the storeroom that there be food in my house and test me now by this, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out uh, your blessing that it shall be more than sufficient, more than sufficient, oddly die uh, so that your lips will be worn out, okay? Lee die, okay? So that, that's how much you'll eat. Like, it's like you'll, as, uh, you know, you'll get tired of winning, okay? You win so much, you get tired. Okay, you'll, be so, you'll eat so much, you'll be so wealthy, you'll be like uh, sick of it, okay? Um, and that's from like being very generous with tithes. So it seems that there is, when it comes to this type of charitable distribution, that does create a, a platform from which we can turn to God with a greater degree of expectation. Normally, we don't test God, we don't expect or demand or have any expectation of, like, sort of, um, uh, of, of reward for a consequence even for our mitzvah. When it comes to charity, it seems that we, at least according to this the source, we can. So the, the, so the, and, and this is the standard text of a mishaverach. A mishaverach, I was having a shlomo, huivarech et ha okay? The sick person or the least sick people, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, so is the daughter of so-and-so. Bavor, on account of she, and then you put your own name here, okay? I, I my name. No der tztaka bavor, I pledge tztaka on his account. This because of it, and then this, God should be merciful upon him, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, heal him and recover and strengthen him and give him life and send him very quickly a full healing from heaven for all of his limbs and all of his uh, sinews. Okay, uh, two hundred forty-eight limbs and six hundred three hundred sixty-five uh, sinews. Okay, amongst all the sick of Israel. Okay, he was an with a goof. Uh, he's healed, healing of spirit, healing of body, and then. There's a little issue here, right? You're not allowed to, uh, we're not supposed to ask things from God on Shabbat, right? We don't, we don't make requests of God on Shabbat. That Shabbat is like, it's a taste of the world to come. It's six days we try to improve the world and work and shape and build and do. And then on seventh day, we inhabit the world as God created as we also created and, and shaped it. We don't, and so we can't even pray for things on Shabbat. So here you're praying for a healing. So you say, Shabbat himuzok ufurak rabalavo. You say, well, I'm not allowed to ask for anything on Shabbat, but let the healing come anyway, okay? It's sort of like, it's sort of an odd, uh, it's like a state, it's like a disclaimer that allows you to uh, kind of, uh, you know, get around things. Um, so this is, so we, we don't say this, we say men and women together. So we, we eliminate this like uh, 248 limbs, 365 uh, sinews. I think we don't exactly, you know, the, the Jewish tradition does not contain a, uh, you know, an accurate knowledge of female anatomy. We don't know, you know, are the numbers the same? Are they different? We don't know. So we just leave that part out. If it's a mixed gender or if, or if it's for a woman, we don't, we don't, we don't assume, presume to know how many uh, limbs and sinews uh, women have. And we include many names altogether. We don't, and we don't pledge daka. We say, and the count of the entire congregation prays in their behalf. So, so the Vedic said we could only could only say Bavor, like on account of do this thing because of what I'm doing, if you pledge the tzedakah. So based on the Gemara and source uh, three, the Gemara and Tiny, but based on he felt this, this, this well, we're praying, so you better send healing. He thought that was um, that was a violation of this iun tefillah. That was sort of like you say that God opens up the file and says, oh really? You know, you, you think you deserve that kind of uh, paying heed? Um, Source five is, is untra- sorry, I didn't translate. This is this is the Misha. This is, this is more similar, more similar to what we say. This is the uh, prayer for the sick from Congregation Yedidya in Jerusalem, where we a lot, some, several of our prayers come from Yedidya. The beautiful uh, um, versions of some of the prayers. So, Misha uh, So this this includes the patriarchs and the matriarchs, which is our version as well. They're not the only ones who um, who uh, do, but but they do. And here you put all the names if you're in the middle here. And he said, who need full healing. Okay, on account of, we are praying for their recovery. And this reward for this, our prayers, you should feel, be filled with mercy uh, for them, recover them, heal them, strengthen them, give them life. 
shlach you know, full healing uh, with all the other sick of Israel, fruit and nefesh of mind and body. And then you say, you know, Shabbat, he, Yom Tov, he would ever meet the Zok. We're not allowed to cry out on, Sh- on Shabbat, but, you know, the healing should come anyway. Um, this is much more similar to what we say. This is actually very nice. I kind of like this a lot. It may be even better than what we say, okay? Um, um, and so here in Rosh Hashanah, again, you see another, you know, another the kind of like way in which charity seems to be maybe more akin to this case in uh, in uh, in Tanit of the of the of the Truma uh, Maestro that that Truma Maestro lead to a reward, but other things don't. So the um, um, It's interesting. It's a very interesting Gemara. Someone says, this seller, this coin, this amount I'm being, I'm pledging to Tzedakah, and it, so that my child should live, so that um, I merit the world to come, that's considered a full-fledged righteous person. Like it's very transactional, which is very strange because we have a whole, you know, and, Commentaries here have a lot to say because we generally, uh, you know, per Kavod, famous, we, we say, uh, and was it, it's Togana it's, uh, Soho says, you should be like the servant who serves his master, not for the sake of reward, right? Rather than the one who serves for the sake of reward. And here, this is very, very transactional, right? I'm giving this coin to Tzedaka because I want you to heal my child, right? This very, very clear cut expectation. And the Gemara says, Harez that said, that's a fully righteous person. Um, so the I believe, said that this was like an exception for this was like the staka exception. So that staka is a different dynamic, and it creates, you know, the 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 stance by which we can ask something from God. And so he felt that was that was for the Mishaberach as well. So that meant that he, if he, um, like when he received an aliyah, he would always pledge staka for Mish- if he got a Mishaberach, he would always make a specific pledge to staka afterwards. Um, anything else? All right, question comments. Have we seen so far? I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so we can see you. Questions or comments on, on this? Reactions? Rabbi, could I say something? Of course you can, yes. It's okay. No, I was going to say it, the 613 commandments, it was the basketball team in Miami Heat. They won the championship with LeBron James, and he was number six. And then they had a guy number one and a guy number three. They were the three stars, and their numbers were six, one, three. Fascinating. Only if they stood in the right order, though. Only worked if they stood in the right order, Joe. They had to stay in the right order. Um, I, I, I listened to a uh, I listened to a lecture today of um, of uh, about Fila, and, and and the teacher said said you know. Somebody, he, somebody asked him, a, a, a young kid, you know, whatever, an eight, eighteen-year-old yeshiva student, asked him, you know, it's appropriate, Rabbi, to pray for, you know, the for a sports game. And he said, absolutely, it's appropriate because if you care about something, like maybe that's like a real, the, the most sincere prayer you've had, you know, like I don't know if you had a very charmed life, you know, maybe you haven't prayed with a lot of sincerity, but if you care about this, you should pray about it, and that's very appropriate. And uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, story reminds me of that, you know, but I, I think that's different. Yeah, it's all different from. Pray for whatever you want, and and uh, the difference is the expectation of that that's going to work. Uh, and I think that's um, that that might, that's the you know you say the mishabir and it's going to work. I, I don't I don't know that. Um, you know I, I I somebody you know we have, we have this mishabir we have this list you know mishabir list, and uh, I. Um, you put your name on the list after six months. I, I mean, I'm pretty good at this now. It took me a while. If you're on the list for six months and you know you haven't you know, without being updated, I, I try to reach out to the person who put the name on the list and say, "How's your uncle doing? You know, should we keep their name on? Should we, you know, should we take them off?" And if it's you know sometimes it was like a chronic, you know, some sort of it's a chronicish condition, and they say, "You know, please keep the name on." And sometimes it was an acute issue and the person's recovered and they just forgot to tell us. So we take the name off and that's, that's great. Um, and I, I, I feel, you know, I, I, um, um, 
you know, Marilyn knows. I, I circle back on some of her, some names of people she knows who she, from she was on. I, I, I don't know if it, if it helps to have, you know, I don't know if there's like a, you know, you can quantify any, any like health outcome for having your name on the list, but I think it's nice to like get a phone call at least every six months. But if you're worried about somebody who's sick, I think that's like a nice thing. Um, I think that that's a, a, a better way to live. I think if, uh, I don't know, if I, I, I thank God, I don't think there's no one I really care a lot about who's who has any like really alarming health issues at this at the moment. Um, but if I did, it would be nice if someone checked in every six months, I don't know, or, or, or even more frequently to, to see how so, so I, So I don't know. That, that, that's how I feel. That's how I, I feel that the that stucca element sort of creates a, some sort of a different. Um, it, it 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 it's it, it's causing something in in the real world, right? That that's my concern is being, is is made real in the stucca that I give. That that's actually helping alleviate suffering right now, and that that's my love for my, you know, sick relative or whatever, my friend. That, that my love and concern and worry has been transformed into the alleviation of suffering through through my stucco pledge. Um, and so and so I don't know what, what the impact of that is on the health impact of the on the patient, but I think it's it's certainly an impact on the world. And so that, that's a different stance than turn to God and say, you know, like I, I'm making the I'm making the world better in the way that I can through my stucco pledge. You know, for these people whom I'm able to help, right? You know, my Money to the Ark is feeding hungry people. My donation to the shul is spreading Torah, you know, amongst my community. Uh, I can't help, you know, my uncle with diabetes, but you can do that, right? So I'm doing what I can do, and now please, God, you do what you can do. So that's a little different than just uh, I'm praying, I'm righteous, so please, you know, reward me. Um, there's, there's a, you know, there, there's a phrase, you know, a rabbinic phrase, tzakat tatsil mimavet, charity, you know, rescues from death, which I know sometimes beggars will say that, people collecting with tzakat tatsil mimavet. So there's a story years and years ago, there was a, there was a, uh, a, um, a, a, a beggar, you know, or Mishulach would, you know, raise money, always say tzakat tatsil mimavet, tzakat tatsil mimavet, this, this, prior, this charity you give will, you know, can save from death. And, and there was a, uh, the story, and this was a very long time ago, this was in the Lower East Side in New York in the old, you know, 100 years ago, and a, uh, a woman with a very sick child was, would give every week to this stucca collector when he said, stuckat it's only mavet, and uh, sadly her, her child died, and, and she, the next week when the collector came and said, stuckat it's only mavet, she was very angry and, and at him because he felt misled, like you said, it would, stuckat has the power to save from death, and he said, no, you misunderstood, it's not, it, it it does like the money you, you the money that you gave me is is keeping people alive right it's feeding hungry people they're starving people kept alive and sustained by this stucca right it does actually defend against death not always in the way that you hope or not always in in uh, everywhere and absolutely right now but it it absolutely does have that impact um, okay so, and I, so I, I guess I'm wondering if there if somehow this this dynamic can can also explain why it is that that chala became associated with healing. So uh, this this you know so let, let's let's take a look at some sources about how. Other questions to come before we go on? Questions, comments, reactions? Okay. I had a quick question, but I think yeah, you might be about to answer it, so I won't. Uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but I I think the distinction that you were drawing was between um, giving tzedakah. Uh, sorry, between saying mishaberach, which prompts you to check in on people, versus giving uh, taking challah, and I guess the idea was that that doesn't prompt. People to no, sorry, them. no, no. I, I guess I was saying no. I was saying the the kind. No, actually, I was. Thank you for asking, because I, I I don't think I was intending implying that, or, or I didn't mean to imply that. I guess I'm saying that the. I, I guess I'm offering a. Interpret. All right. Let me. Let me this is good. This is pushing me. Let me let me say let me say this in a. Here's what I'm really saying. <laughs> I'm saying that expecting God to heal a sick person just because I asked nicely, okay, is um, I think is, is um, 
it's fine to do from the perspective of like, if you feel something, you should say it to God. Like, you, sorry, let me, okay. Step one, you should always ask God for things that you care about, whether it's a sports victory, whether you're desperately, desperately worried about someone who's ill, like pour out your troubles to God, include that in your prayers, put it into the Rafa'inu blessing of the Amidah, wherever it's appropriate, ask for the things that you really care about. Make your prayers personalized and sincere. That's one. Step two is, to demand or expect that God will heal your loved one merely because you asked um, or did some other mitzvah might indeed be a violation of this concept we saw in the Talmud of iyun tefillah, right? It's a presumptuous expectation that my prayers will be answered, which the Talmud warns us against because it causes God to go looking through your file to see if you deserve it. That's two. <laughs> Step three, however, this Mishaberach blessing can be rectified and can be improved if it is um, tied to a pledge shitzaka, which is actually causing um, real, immediate, tangible blessing in the world through my own um, actions. Uh, and that gives us a different stance with, from which to you know, make a request from God and is actually making the world better, right? It's, 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 it's a, it's a it's a win-win, you know, or it's, it's whether or not, you know, the person's health condition improves, the world is better, there is more health, there is more blessing in the world through that stuck gift. And I guess sort of the ancillary piece of that my own like six month uh, check-in with people who put a name on the list is, um, is a lesser but comparable way to, for their, you know, to kind of, it's like a rational humanist kind of twist on the Misha Berach ritual, it's not you submit a name on the list and then magically God sends healing, it's you submit a name on that list and now um, your community knows that you're distressed with worry over someone in your circle of concern who's, who's sick. And now there's care and concern directed towards you, which I think is a good thing to, to like have more of in the world. Okay, thank you for pushing, was that more clear? Yes, thank you so much. Great. So that was something more clear to me. So thank you for pushing me to, to formulate it that way. So now I want to see, so having like kind of gone through that, let's see if we can, let's see what we can find in the ritual of Chava, okay? Which is a different ritual with a different dynamic and a different history. But like, like how does this mitzvah, which has nothing to do with healing per se, um, gets associated with women, you know, calling each other before Shabbos saying, please have so-and-so in mind when you take Chava. Okay, or I'm baking Chava this week, tell me who the sick people are, right? So, um, Okay, here's the source in uh, the Torah for the midst of Chala. And Numbers 15, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land to which I'm taking you and you eat of the bread of the land, you shall set aside some as a gift of the Lord. As the first seal of your baking, you shall set aside a loaf as a gift. You shall set aside a gift, like the gift from the threshing floor. So like, like Truma, you shall give to the Lord from your first yield of your baking throughout the ages. Okay, so you have to, so it's like, it's like, it's like Truma. So it's a, you know, set aside portion, but instead of being set aside from the grains, it's set aside from the dough. And it was in ancient times given to the Kohen, since there are no Kohanim, nobody is pure right now. We're unpure, the dough is impure, the Kohanim are not pure, so no one can eat it, so it gets it gets burned. Uh, but that that's the basic mitzvah. It says nothing about uh, healing, right? Nothing about right. Also, nothing about being a woman's woman's mitzvah per se, right? And that's not in the mitzvah as well. And explicitly, you know, it's 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 not a woman's mitzvah, right? It's whoever bakes bread mitzvah, which is you know often women, but not necessarily so, and. Uh, you know, yeah, and so so it's uh, so those associations are are a little bit uh, are um, um, yeah they are they are okay. So Sefer Chinuch says Sefer Chinuch. Um, I don't know if you ever learned Sefer Chinuch before. I'll just give my my uh, Sefer Chinuch is a medieval work from Spain. I don't think we really know exactly who wrote it. It's written anonymously. Uh, the book goes through every mitzvah in the Torah and gives you like the basic information about the mitzvah, like how do you do it. What does it entail? Um, who's obligated? Is it men? Is it women? Is it obligated only land of Israel, like agricultural mitzvah? Is it obligated everywhere a Jew might be? Uh, and then sometimes he has a paragraph like this one where he says, and here are some of like the deeper meanings of the mitzvah. Here's what it's about, the roots of the mitzvah. Okay, so what does he say? The roots of this commandment that is since the sustenance of a person is through food and most of the world will be sustained with bread, um, the omnipresent, 
that's his name for God, desire to give us merit with a constant commandment in our bread, that blessing should rest upon it through the commandment and through it, we will receive merit for our souls. So in other words, it's like a, the, 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 let's, you know, the, the Torah gives us an opportunity to do a mitzvah, like every day at every meal through, through this mitzvah of separating challah. So it's like, and it's like wonderful. Like it's, it's, we get to have mitzvah all the time. This basic human activity of preparing food is connected to a mitzvah. And hence it turns out that the dough is food for our body and food for our soul, beautifully, beautiful. Additionally, it is in order that the servants of God, those that are constantly involved in his service, and these are the priests, the Kohanim should be sustained with an ancient other. Oh, right. Also it provides for the Kohanim in, in the original system when purity laws were maintained, everyone got to eat through, um, through, through like the Kohanim got to eat in this way. They, they weren't farming, they weren't involved in commerce. They were devoted to you know, serving God in the temple. So they had the other sources of food. So every time anybody baked a loaf of bread, they'd give a little bit to the Kohen. That's how the Kohanim could get some food. Uh, whereas the tithe of the threshing floor, there's labor for them to pass the grain through the sieve and to grind it. Here, the nation, nation will come to them without any pain, right? The Kohanim already have other sources of food. They have... Um, the other, they have other sources of food. They have the trumot, the regular tithe, the trumot and maestro, they have the, which uh, go to the kohen. Uh, but those they have, to, they have to grind, they have to process those grains for food. This is like no labor at all. Right? Every time you bake a loaf of bread, you give a little bit to the kohen. I guess they have, they have little small loaves, little uh, like slider buns. Um, and uh, thank you for that. Okay, and, uh, and, that, and that, that's how they are, um, that's how they're sustained. Still, really, nothing about um, anything about the sick person, right? Any if, if you knew if this is all what you knew about the mitzvah, would you would you like would you predict that there would be like healing rituals associated with it? If this is what you knew from the the sefer Kenneth is like the Middle Ages, you know, I think the 12th century, 13th century, right? Not not really there, right? Um, this is how I go with my money out, which is a medieval Ashkenazi commentary on the Rambam. So I believe it's from the 13th century. Righteous woman is called Chana, which stands for Chalanida and Habaka. Okay, three, so this is for already at the time. So these are three mitzvot that become associated with women. Shekhaim Shashah Mitzvot Elu, currently she did these three mitzvot in an appropriate way. Now, none of these mitzvot are women's mitzvot in the sense that these are not women's obligations. These are universal obligations for Jews, um, right? Men and women have to separate chala if they make dough. Men and women have to observe the nida restrictions. Men and women have to make sure that there are lights lit in their homes before Shabbat. But in time, for various reasons, um, they became associated with uh, women. Very nice. So Kali one gave her the desire of her heart and the expression of her lips. A child, right? Meaning Hannah, Hannah, like in the referring to Hannah in uh, the book of Sam, Samuel's mother. And therefore, women should always pray at the time when the mitzvah is at home, and she's fulfilling it according to all its laws. That the merciful one should give her righteous children who fear God and recognize His blessed name. So Hannah, um, in the book of Samuel, prayed for a child. It's actually the, the Talmud. It's one of the, the one of like the models for how we pray. We we learn how we pray from the prayer of Hannah. The Masechet Brachot, the Talmud goes through that story and finds, you know, our laws of prayer are modeled off of, off of the Book of Samuel's description of Chana's prayer. But Chana also stands for Chala Nida and Habaka. So these, these women's mitzvot, these mitzvot that are, again, not really women's mitzvot, but mitzvot that are often performed by women or associated with women, um, are therefore become opportunities for other women, right, down the ages to pray for children in the same way that Chana in Book of Samuel prayed for a child. Um, so this is sort of getting there, right? This is sort of saying these, these are these 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 mitzvot of that are like associated with the home in a very sort of like rooted kind of homey kind of way um, are opportunities for praying for, you know, building a family, which is not the same as praying for, you know, a sick cousin um, or, you know, some terrible accent you read about in the news, but it's, it's, it's moving in that direction, I think. Um, and I think maybe it's even building off of what we saw in Sefer Chinuch. Sefer Chinuch is saying, you know, it, it, there's a, it's about like 
kind of a constant God awareness in the mundane activities of life that like, like baking bread, making bread, every meal, you got to have some bread. Okay. So you're constantly think, doing, doing mitzvah in, in just part of your daily routine. This mitzvah has an element, like a charity element or, a, or not maybe charity is the wrong word. It has a stuck elements insofar as you're, it's a, it's like a tax that sustains communal servants. The Kohanim are busy teaching Torah, serving God in the Beit HaMikdash. And so this sustains them and feeds them as well. Um, so there's that like stuck at element a little bit. And we see here in Hagoma uh, uh, like it, it's um, the, the suggestion that performing these mitzvot are opportunities to pray. Um, it's still a jump to like, you know, what happens in contemporary, you know, whatever, 21st century orthodoxy of, you know, social media, you know, like lists of like, have these people in mind as I separate challah. Uh, that that's like a that's a later jump, but I I think it's I don't know I I think it. You see these sources, you're like, oh yeah, I, I can. I'm not surprised that this moment, this mitzvah would would take on extra practices or extra valence, right, and an extra meaning. Question comments? I'm gonna stop sharing so you can. Sorry. Uh, Rabbi, I once bought uh, challah dough frozen. Yeah. And I baked it. Uh, yeah. Should I have separated challah? It was like from like one of those like you know geffen you know frozen challah things in a box. Like it came from. It was yeah, like, I mean, it was many years ago. I don't know the brand, but it, you know. Yeah, so almost certainly, the... almost certainly, they separated challah at the factory before they froze it and put it in a box. Mm -hmm. And it probably says on the box challah has been taken, um, because they just generally do that. And uh, um, yeah, so you you probably yeah almost certainly, but if not, then yes, you should have. <laughs> but but I, I, almost certainly they do. Uh, this is sometimes an issue. You know, it's an issue sometimes in schools where sometimes like um, like you know preschools or, or elementary schools will, will will make challah on Friday. So that's a it's a great activity for kids. Very age appropriate for little kids to make dough and they. Get their hands dirty, it's all wonderful. And then you want to teach them about this beautiful mitzvah. You have them take challah. So you have the kids, you know, take challah and say the bracha, and that's very nice. So that, that, that's wonderful, like the, to teach kids to do mitzvah. The problem is um, kids, can't, kids can't do mitzvah, okay? Uh, a child below bar mitzvah age can't do a mitzvah, can't actually separate challah to make the dough permissible, and it's no good. So uh, if, if you're Preschool or elementary, you know, bake challah in school. Comes home with challah on Friday. Maybe they can eat it, but maybe it's not kosher for the rest of us. Okay, because if if the child took the challah, it's not it's not uh, doesn't count. If the, te the teacher has to take the challah, it has to be an adult who doesn't. Um, when, when we lived in Jerusalem, one day when, when Sarah was pregnant with the twins, she was walking, which maybe was why she was asked to do this. Like the 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 somebody at the pizza shop <laughs> in our neighborhood saw her walking down the street and called her into the store to separate challah uh, for their new batch of pizza dough. Um, I think he felt like, you know, it'd be like, I don't know, it'd be like win-win situation. She got to the mitzvah and, you know, I don't know, pregnant women are looking for opportunities to do mitzvah. And I guess, he, you know, she seemed like a, someone who knew what she was doing and would be able to take challah, you know, so that was like a sort of fun, like only in Israel kind of, kind of uh, memory. Um, but uh, you know, I, I inquired when when our um, when we first moved. You know, when we had um, uh, very often CJDS distributes little like bags of challah dough to the kids on Friday, and then you make it into a little shape and you bake it. It's very very nice. Um, I think you know now that whatever now the kids are older, like in middle school, they don't do this. <laughs> in elementary school, they do it. But I think when we first moved here, like oh no, like they bake this dough like in the school. Do they do they know? Do they, they do, were they were they careful? Did a teacher you know? So I wrote a very, I wrote a letter like really you know an email to somebody at the school trying to like be very respectful and not imply that they didn't know how to do it, but like just wanted to like make sure. And I was, didn't want to you know I was, really didn't know anyone very well, and I didn't want to offend anyone, but I wanted to make sure that you know. And they said, oh no, no, we get them from the from we don't make them ourselves. We get them from one of the kosher bakeries up north, and they definitely separate challah before they put it into little bags and give it to us. And then I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, and then they started giving us all the extra dough bags at the end of the week you know, that they couldn't find people to take. So there were a couple of weeks we had lots and lots of little rolls. But now the kids are I don't know. We only have one one uh, student in the CGS elementary school now, so we don't get too much, too many challah dough bags anymore. Um, Okay, other questions or comments? 
I have a quick question following up on what Marilyn was asking. Sure. Um, so people at a factory are baking like loaf after loaf after loaf of challah, mm -hmm. and they're always separating. And then somebody buys a loaf. Who gets the merit for separating the dough? It's a good question. I would think it's the one who separates it. You know, I think it's not so, you know, let them, you know, it's not an easy job working in a bakery. So let them get a little mitzvah merit. I think it's, I think the mitzvah is to separate. So I think they're separating. If you want to say like, we're all implicated because we're buying kosher bread from a kosher bakery that carries this mitzvah, that's fine. But at the end of the day, like the one who separates is doing the mitzvah. That's probably somebody working at the bakery who's doing it. Um, I, I don't know what's, I don't think this has to be done for like factory, you know, like a, like you buy like your uh, jewel brand sliced wheat bread, whatever, which they're made in some factory in Mexico. I, I don't think anyone is separating challah on that bread. I don't think it's obligated. I don't think it's, I think it's only if like a Jew is making the dough. I don't think if it's like a corporation making the dough, I don't think it's obligated to separate challah. Uh, but the bakeries do and, and I think that's, let them have their mitzvah. I think that's nice. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, I, I'm gonna, as we did last week, I'm gonna, I want to, um, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say Mishaberich. I'm gonna say this, the, the version that, from Yedidia, even though it includes the, the, the version of the Vedic, you know, it was thought was problematic. I mean, he had, I just, you know, um, it's sort of odd that I'm sort of, even though I just defended uh, and explained his position, I'm gonna, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I guess he had a very cogent argument, but the world seems to have not accepted it or not 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 been concerned for it. So we 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 try to, um, I, I guess because we, I guess because the we, we're not expecting that God is necessarily going to answer, but because we're sort of expressing expressing our own um, concern, our own anxiety, our own distress, that people we care about are not well, uh, and that's a way that we can take care of one another. Uh, and not, not only is it a way, you know, it's not a demand of God, it's a sharing our distress with God, and it's a way that we can um, take care of one another. So I'm going to say the, just let me share now, um, based on what's on the source sheet, and I'm going to quickly say the names of the, from our, the shul's uh, sick list. Thank you for joining us, joining me. Uh, next week, third week, we're going to look at sort of a broad, take a big picture look at Jewish perspectives on, on the practice of medicine more broadly, okay, and, and medical interventions uh, as a, you know, way, way, as a thing that we do versus uh, something more uh, like purely spiritual approach to, to illness, okay, so that'll be next, next Wednesday. Okay, thanks everyone and have a good night and uh, get in touch. Thank you. Thanks.